years ago, specifically for Florida conditions. In fact, um, uh, it was designed by our emergent uh, industry, uh, based really in the east central coast of Florida, in part because of the passage of a new aquaculture leasing program in 1989. And in that program, one of the provisions was the prohibit, you were prohibited the use of mechanical harvest. Prior to that, that new industry over there in the Indian River Lagoon was using the bottom culture technology that was transported from the mid Atlantic and Northeast states. And they were using mechanical harvesting plants. In fact, I remember seeing an escalated rate by the storms of Florida. bottom bag was developed. It was made out of, a, and it is made out of a woven polyester mesh material so that it can contain the clams. So the typical size is four foot by four foot uh, with a spout about eight inches on the end so that you can stock your seed inside the bag. It was a technology that was then transferred over to the west coast of Florida in the 1990s, primarily through the efforts of training programs for uh, fishers at that so you see a few pictures there on the right, how they are staked down, in this case, the individual bags staked down to the bottom of the seashore that go outside there, so you can see how they're arranged and look, planted like um, themselves they have a very strong foot, allow the product and the bag to become embedded in the bottom. What's wrong? Oh, your oh. My voice is scratching. <laughs> okay, I'll stay still. <laughs> um, the bag works very effective here in CDC. Lucifer and Cedar Key, it has had some issues in some other parts of the state, and it is used as far north as the Carolinas, but a very effective here. And in part, possibly because we are out in the open Gulf of Mexico with the atypical. Um, or mesh material as opposed to a, a high density polyethylene had to be strong enough to contain the, uh, to um, pull those clams up out of the bottom I'm talking about a weight of 60 to 80 pounds and hold them and the seams hold on that uh, as they are harvested either by hand as you see there or a winch from the boat or a roller rig from the boat helping to pull that out of the bottom Very quickly from the job training programs here, where we're talking about planting individual bags on small scale farmers and fishermen and um, new clam farmers here. We really started to put these bags together using table top racks. means of doing this and very effective again here in Cedar Key and as you can see in the upper right hand picture also allows you to be very efficient in laying these out in rows and and utilize your your space on your lease effectively now again The bag, the bag also serves as predator protection. So you've got cover netting on top and cover netting on the bottom, which, which is pretty effective in minimizing predators, predators that you might see. Might see uh, uh, but, but 
as we continue to increase the number of clam farmers, increase the amount of clams being planted in leases, particularly here in Cedar Key, we and increase in predation and primarily from large schools of fish, black. The, the ray, for example, uh, uh, migratory um, species, species here, here in the Gulf of Mexico. And they certainly learn rather quickly to stop off in Cedar Key and fuel up. Um, it was very interesting <laughs> about the mid 1990s when some of the clam growers were reporting reporting losses of the bags. clams in their bags. They would notice their bags, but nothing would be in it. That made no sense. That made no sense. They were thinking it was theft of seed. Nobody would have nobody would have the bags on the bottom. And it took a while to look at the bags and inspect the light, the slight abrasion of the fabric, as well as the small butterfly holes that are that are very indicative of Cowno's ray predation. They're voracious shellfish. Predators. So we, so we needed to do, to do something, something to protect the soft bag. Um, we needed a more inflexible cover netting. One of the first things is to procure. Let's attach it with cable ties to your bags. Um, it does provide protection. protection. There's a lot of school of thought, whether you want one, one inch, inch, two inch, inch hex, or whether you buy Chinese product versus US product. Versus US product. Um, a lot of discussion of that over the years. years. Um, it also is very effective in keeping the belts, belts in place, place and implanting them. them. It helps spread the seed out. out. It's, it's biodegradable. It rusts. Rust. You yeah. can't reuse it. So there's pluses and minuses in that. The other type of cover netting that was also developed and is certainly being used today as well is the high density polyethylene plastic netting or bird, bird netting as some folks call it. Uh, the same function. Um, the difference is it obviously does not degrade in the environment. It can be reusable, but that is the product that is most visible. What we're discussing today. So when you're first planting your bags or belt of bags, they're not secured to the bottom yet. You have to stake them down um, until they become embedded in the bottom. Some of the, so the first stake material used was fence post wire. You could buy it in rolls and then you could cut it the size you want and get it into the shape you want. And it was pretty cheap. But the problem was um, is that over time, areas exposed particularly yeah, I don't know where my little thing is, whatever. But you usually get the bin where it's closed out of the mud and it oxidized, that's where it rusts. These were reused. There. Another early development that was short-lived. Short -lived. Plastic, plastic wire, wire, plastic, plastic wires, wires from Walmart. From Walmart. Buy them cheap. cheap. With some With wire snippers, what do you get? You get two cheap steaks. Steaks. But they're what? That didn't last long. We picked last. up quite a few of those from the shoreline barrier. barrier. What the industry what the uses, is using now is now um, the PVC pipe. The PVC what? pipe. What? And I think you'll hear from our growers now. It's tie wrapped or cable tied to your netting that you put there, in this case, chicken wire with, with the um, bottom bag. Another approach to, again, to um, minimize duration is net coatings to the thought behind this is to the mesh. Well, location. crop cycles, but it does require, the, the coating does require DAX approval. There is a technical bulletin on that, and there are several of the products that are, have been pre-approved um, by DAX for use on clam culture gear. We've also tried and looked evaluated several of these coatings, these coatings that have, have anti-fouling properties. Failing properties. We looked at those coatings that, coatings that are biocide-free. None of the coatings that have copper, for example, in that. 
we've done, we've done some field trials and testing with that. And, and as you can see on the pictures on the left, you know, at times, whether it's the, the grass area, the aquatic um, the weeds there, or tunicates or sponges, you can get quite a bit of fouling on top. Problematic because it reduces through the mesh openings of the bag. We did find that it was effective in reducing biofouling. We did field trials. There was only really one coating that might be considered cost effective at the time. It was a cost of about a buck seventy five per bag. Now it did also no, it did provide some stiffening properties as well. But interestingly but enough, in all of those field trials, we found that there were no improvements were no in plant improvement production plant by production using, those, using coatings. those coatings. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. So, so, so some consideration in what you do for predator protection and what you know everybody has their own methods. Some people are advocates for chicken wire or plastic netting. Some use a combination with the coatings. So some of the considerations are does it minimize predation on your lease, the bag and It does go grow, it does growers preference loss. A little bit, and I mean a little bit about hurricane and storm preparation because basically the bags are embedded in the bottom. Um, in fact, I remember our first experience with um, some severe weather was when we were uh, had our bags out at the sand spit as part of the training program in the no name storm of March 1993 came barreling through with a 10 foot tide surge. We came back several days later and just found the rows of bags still intact, but scouring, major amount of scouring on either side of those rows. So they actually kind of served like a bulkhead effect. Now we haven't been that fortunate. Um, years ago, I guess our growers estimated almost a direct here to hit here to Estimating about a 33% loss. Um, the, the bags that have recently been planted are the most vulnerable to storm surge and excessive wind. Um, and what is you could just go out prior to a storm and add additional staking material to the bags and the cover nettings. That, I mean, these are generally your nursery bags, your seed bags. I mean, that's going to restart you. So it's worth the effort to go and try and Resecure those. Um, after the event, you can go out and restate flagging bags. Again, most of these events occur when it's hot or have hot water temperatures, so mortality can be rather fast. And again, the other major impact is impact. or whatever, and try and dislodge some of. In the buried sediment. That's generally the, the primary losses as a result of a hurricane. Um, just a couple of other things, because we have lost lease markers and they've had to be replaced recently, is to make sure you have GPS coordinates or some monuments on each of the corner. Obviously, keep inventory records, document losses, etc. So, our hurricane plan is really nominal for the use of um, bottom bags for clam culture. So what's going on in new? Um, working with FDAX and some researchers at Florida State University and as well as an R&D company, they're based out of Texas, there is an effort to look at the okay, and we don't know the technical or research going in that direction. We have a local growers association, RCK, that funds a dumpster located near a launch area that helps facilitate the disposal of, of covering and culture here. Obviously we have a focus of cleanup this week and more awareness. That's uh, am I muted? You're working on it, sorry. 
All right, so on the panel, we have Matthew Witt, LT Camp, Clamps, uh, Craig Parks, Vinny Sister, and Joey Cannon, with the Security Operations Association. This is me. Joe. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't put that out there. Use the box. You don't hear me. I'm going to go through this and then we'll stop. Um, so, all of these are folks that have been in the claim business for a number of years. They have a variety of leases um, in different areas uh, of CDP so they can talk about their experiences, what works, what doesn't. Uh, have you had prob problems with storms, hurricanes? Do you have a plan? run like hell, um, and anything else they want to contribute to this discussion. We need to work on this audio. So this is not working. For some reason, there are I can see it. All right, All right, so, uh, so, so I have, I have that, that our folks. All right, so can our folks online now hear us? All right, so I'm going to, Bobby, you want to take a few minutes here and talk about your experiences, um, and then we'll pass the mic to... Okay, hi, you know, my name's Bobby. Uh, on my farms, we, as Leslie alluded to, we have different substrate. We have different substrate on different uh, parcels. So every parcel is kind of different. And uh, the amazing part out here is you can have two parcels right next door to each other and they perform totally different from one another. Um, so what we do mostly on our harder bottom, we'll use the uh, dip bags because they seem to do real well on the hard bottom. And on the softer bottom, we prefer the plastic because it helps keep, keep it up out of the mud a little bit, keep it from burying too much. And on the softer bottom leases, um, for us, the chicken wire doesn't work at all because uh, it'll just rot out on top of the bag and then all the old rusty chicken wire is left around the perimeter. And you put that in your hands and everything else out there trying to work. So. We kind of mix it up depending on where we're planting is how we plant. And, um, I guess that's it. Oh, I pray a lot. Uh, uh, actually, we we take uh, we do something different. We take crab rope with long PVC stakes and uh, we strap it over plant each plant. We just go back and forth and stake over the stakes with the crab rope. And my experience has been with that is um, a lot of times the gear will still blow up, but you don't lose as much of it. It'll hang up on those ropes. You'll find your bags wrapped around that rope. Now, not all of them. A lot of the bags still get away, but um, uh, the rope helps a lot. But it's a lot more work, as the oysterman alluded to. We have to put it out. Then it fouls up before you get it back in. And, you know, it's a lot of work to strap them down, but that is what we do. So, all right, okay. Craig, and you got a show and tell too. <laughs> Hello, my name is Craig Parks. I manage all processing at B&E Seafood. This monster right here is one of the things we prefer. We we use plastic for our nursery. Um, prefer chicken wire on our grow out. Uh, we'll use the, we'll use the plastic on our nursery because of what Mr. Witt alluded to. Um, you're pulling your nursery within anywhere two to four months and the chicken wire is still going to be there. The one thing I've done here, I do not use chicken or I don't use um, zip ties on the edges of my bag. And it's really critical. Guys that don't or that work for it, they learn right off. You'll put your steak 
we put our steak, we put our steak through, the through the bag. We do not use zip ties to, zip ties to attach the chicken wire, wire to the bag. Right we through. put it right through the very edge. What Mr. Wood was talking Mr. about. Talking if, about. If I put this, I put steak, this steak two, two tears in, tears in this, piece of, this piece of wire is going to be buried up in the buried mud. Up in the mud. It'll, It'll never rot. rot. It's going to be there the day you pull it 14 months from now. If I put it on the if edge, this chicken wire stays exposed. Your stakes hold everything in the ground. There's nothing left in nine, 10 months. It actually, it depends on the brand of chicken wire. American made seems to hold up a little better. We try to use red top. Um, that chicken wire will hold anywhere from three to five months. It depends on the consistency of our salinity. I've seen it gone as little as three. I've seen it hang around for six or seven months. Um, I prefer the chicken wire. The biggest benefit you get is it holds that bag down flat from day one. If you do your job right, staking, it's there. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, it, the little bit of extra weight it does add, it will, it, it will hold the clams down. That's how I get away with having good luck on muddy bottom is by putting my steak in the cab that don't have that remnant. Um, that is a pain, and I know exactly what you're talking about. But we just prefer it. Um, it's something I was raised into when I started at BE. It's how we did it. I've evolved this system from 25 bags long to where we just do seven bag belts. There's no scientific reason. It's just I only have room for three pieces of plywood for our table. That happens to be 28 feet long. That's the reason why we do seven bag belts. Um, it works out. It works out really good on the lease and everything like that. Uh, really, the biggest really the biggest benefit for me is just the sheer fact it does a lot of the work for you. When I roll this out, done. I got a guy coming right behind me putting stakes down on both sides. It's over at that point. Um, just like Mr. Bobby said, I use. We'll take picture this. This is your belt when you roll it out. This is going to be seven bags long. I'll take a extra long PVC stake. Somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood, neighborhood about three to four feet and I'll, and I'll run a piece of this crab rope we use it's sink rope and I'll run it series of yeah. goes diagonally across maybe five to six belts I'll use 60 70 feet of rope right there and stick it stick it stick it just like you said they will pull up but it's still going to be there one of the benefits with chicken wire when 28 feet of chicken wire rolls up because they will pull up but when it rolls up I can, I can go, go out, out there in four feet of water and see it. And, and I, can I can go retain my bag back, back and I'll flatten, flatten everything back out and roll it down. down. Um, other, other than that, that that's, you know, know that, that's our storm. We, we got, got so good at the storm, storm protection with the rope that last year it scared Irma off completely. We didn't have to worry <laughs> about anything. Thank you. The year before, <laughs> yeah. mean, we didn't do anything. And yeah, yeah we it, it didn't blow the bags. It did out of. Let's, Let's just say, say in the, the number, number 600 bags, bags that were planted within four months of the storm, maybe 90 of them got blown up. So that, that's not a real good average. But we went out and we were able to retrieve, I think, probably 90%. And it was just a matter of the chicken wire's loss at that point. You bring it on back in, you straighten everything back out and roll them back out. I just did some math a minute ago. We're paying about $65 a roll of chicken wire it will cover 45 bags that comes to about a dollar 40 a bag that's what we're using so that's my take on the chicken wire now i do have a question for all of you because i forgot and a lot of folks in the audience won't know that this mesh is for grow out size seed and then, then we it's kept down for a minimum 10 to 15 how many months until harvest size we do have a smaller mesh bag the nursery bag we put our small seed in for a period of anywhere from two to six months. It depends when seasonally planted. So that also has to be covered. So you want to talk about that? I, I use plastic. Um, now, if, if I know we've got rough weather and I'm planting that day in bad weather and I just had to get the seed out in my nursery seed, um, the footprint of the bag is the same. It's still four by four, but it's just smaller mesh. And that's where you lose your you could just flood the bank right there if you kill a hundred thousand nursery seed. I mean you lose six bags of nursery seed, you're backing up a lot farther than six bags of that. But if I know there's bad conditions that I've got to get this seed down in, I'm gonna use chicken wire. I hate it because in four months when I go pull it, I'm I gotta make sure my tetanus shot is up to date. Um, but other than that, I use plastic. And I retain, and I'd use the plastic the same way. I, I run it right through the edge. I don't use zip ties. Um, it works for us. 
and it, it's easy because when I go back and get the plastic, I uncover it. I'll pop a, a strand on the edge of the, chi the plastic and I can roll that up and retain it and bring it back in with me and reuse it. Um, we're, I'm kind of cheap and I feel like I've spent money on something and it's still around tomorrow. I might as well use it again, correct? So that's kind of what we do. But if, Here's another you, method for nursery bags. Because you typically may have a five foot width of your plastic netting. And most people will prefer to use plastic netting because the same thing, the, it doesn't oxidize in time under your nursery period. So, and of course, now you've got buoyant materials here and you've got seed that doesn't weight it down. Um, so we take PVC pipe here and um, string a rope through there and then attach that also through that mesh. I mean, almost the entire um, perimeter of that belt. That's worked really well. Bobby, do you use spreader bars on your plastic at all? Yeah, that, that's kind of the way we are. Right. We use a four foot spreader bar. If I'm doing a self back belt, I'll use a spreader bar, a spreader bar, one in the middle, one in the middle, one at the other end. And it, it helps everything lay down really nice and flat, too. But um, uh, I know that I am the exception as far as chicken wire. There's a lot of people that don't like it. And they say, uh, and they say, eaten up by the predator, up by the predator because, of because of it. Knock on wood, knock on wood. The numbers, the numbers that we lose, in my, opinion, in my opinion, outweighs. outweighs. I mean, I, we, we, we benefit, we benefit more than anything, more than anything, anything that we lose. It's, it's just, it's just what we're used to, and it works for us. Okay, so um, I've heard from Bobby and and um, Craig. Do you use um, any of the coatings? No. All right, we got. Okay, you, in conjunction. Okay, well, let's hear from Joey since he, yeah. Okay, um, okay. Um, I actually don't. I actually do don't do what either, do. What either of them do. I, do. I dip. I dip bags. Um, I when I got into the business and uh, it was in, in two thousand. I started with my dad, and he used chicken wire. Right then and there, I figured out real quick I couldn't stand the stuff. And then, and then um, when I started working for one company. We used a little bit of cut. We used a little bit of cover net, and it was when the five hurricane, five hurricane came, came through. We lost like three million nursery, and I said, "You know what? That, that's 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 just too much money being lost." So, and I'm not against. I get and when I and I am on the board, and we talk about the debris, and I'm always the one that's that pipes off. That I don't like either of the cover nets. I use dip. I've dip bags for. Almost 20 almost years. twenty years. Um, nineteen, um, 19 years, years to be exact. I've been dipping bags. I dip my nursery I bags. bags. I dip my grow out bags. Now yes. the thing is, it works. It works in certain areas. Certain areas. areas. It doesn't, doesn't areas. work in other areas. Your time your restraint, restraint on, the and on the other side, side on the other side of the island with it. And so, and so, in the bottom, in the bottom so you some like some people don't like using the dip bag and soft bottom. Well, I've done it. Like and when like you've when you've got nurse, when nurse, your nursery comes and it's flooded it's flooded with oyster spat, I'll put, I'll, I'll, put, I'll, I'll, put I'll, 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 I won't pick that spat out. I'll put it right into the bag, I'll plant it but in I'll plant it in a really soft bottom. It kills all that oyster spat. So I'm not here to grow. So I'm not here to grow. I'm here to grow a And uh, and uh, it's simpler. It's, 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 simpler. it's, it's faster, quicker. It's faster. It's easier. And and I'm for me it was for me it was we were able to produce more. We were able to do. We were able to do. We were able to do mass quantities easier. Less bodies. Less bodies. And, and the overheads. The overheads, overheads, the overheads about, about the same. Because it did cost money. money. Barrel, barrel, barrel of dip from Death Labs right is right around eight hundred dollars. Cost and per bag. Cost, cost per bag. bag you get five hundred bags out of a out of a barrel. So, so the cost per bag is the same, but you got to cut that in. The, the FDA approves mineral spirits. Mineral spirits isn't cheap. And, and Mental spirits is a pain in the butt, and and, and then you're now you're messing with the toxics, and some, and some people, people don't like messing with that. You got to got to be in a ventilated area. You got to have space to do bags, and, and a lot of places don't have that space, and you don't want to do that in town because then you're offending your neighbor. Because it's because it's it, it, you you don't smell a you don't smell covering it. You don't smell chicken wire. When somebody's dipping bags, there's an aroma. So it's there's so it's there's a little bit of difference. So you gotta be polite. And so you gotta but, uh, be polite. but uh, it works. It works. I get bags. I get bags eaten. Sometimes. If Sometimes I'm if I'm lazy about what I'm doing or if I push it because you can't, you can't dip bags in the rain. 
it, 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 it doesn't work. It'll, it'll make, work. The make the bag soft. If the bag soft, the bags are going to eat. But not, but ninety percent of the time, I'm going to turn. My, I'm going to turn just as good, good, if not as better, than what they're doing with using Covernet. Storm prep. Storm prep for me. Storm prep for me. We all have the same thing. We're going to. I don't do it. The way I don't do it the way they did it. Uh, and the reason I didn't is just too much to do. Um, what we did was the way we looked at things was your nurseries. Where if a hurt, her mean was hitting, we worried about our nurse. We 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 roped off our nursery because if we were going to get buried up, we had to have that to come back to. Unfortunately, unfortunately, our nursery got buried up. When we got when we got. Got back finally got back to her. It was eight inches, was under, eight inches under mud. mud. There's nothing. We There's do. nothing we could do. Yeah. Happens. Happens. All right. We got time for questions and a suit. Oh. Oh. Shh. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. Some of you. Some of you use cover nets. Some don't. Some use chicken wire. Some don't. And some dip. <clears throat> How do you all feel about? The cover net that's out there that you may not have contributed to, but we seem to have a vast amount of it about going out and picking it up and cleaning it up if we have these days. And how do you take care of your waste yourselves? And if you hire people out and you do use cover net and they bring in 50 baskets, do you check and see if they brought the cover net back? Okay, you want to start, Joey? Yeah. Okay, you're ready. We are stewards. We are stewards. Every clam every 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 farmer is a steward. Out there, I, out don't, there, I don't countless I don't times I've brought in cover net. Because if cover floating, floating out there, and, 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 it's, close and it's close to where I freshly planted, it's going to catch, it's my, gonna my, catch bag. my bag. And, and it's going to pull, and my, it's gonna product pull my product up. I'm well, then I'm losing money. So out of the benefit of the environment, out of the benefit of self-preservation, I'm going to bring it in. And and, and, I, I and I know they will. We, we all and have. We, bags. we all have. I've uh, people in here that, people in here that I when bags, I lost bags, they came to me and said, "Hey, Joe, after the storm, after the storm, I, found I found a belt of clams. Well, thank you. I went, thank got you. Them I went and got them and got them and back down. And back down. So we all worked. So together. we all worked together. Did that help? Did that help? If I didn't see all those yellow dots, I'm not saying they're yellow. They're not. They're not. There's a lot of yellow dots. Oh, I, oh think I think we should. We I, 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 somebody, somebody said, said we're a family, family earlier when we were talking about oysters. oysters. And I looked, and I looked at Anthony and, 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 and I said, we are a family. We're just we're fun, we're, we're a family. <laughs> <laughs> we, are. we are. Craig, you guys. Oh, we are. We'll fight. Craig, you want to answer that? Because you used yeah. chicken wire. Yeah. Uh, you know, Sue, Sue you, you know, hit on something earlier about how do I feel about others that use. And I do. Plastic, don't get me wrong, but, but I, I could. And, and has I have I had a piece blow off and I couldn't, uh, you know, attest for it? Yeah, I don't think there's anybody in this room that's ever used it that can't say that. Do I bring back every piece I can't? Yes, ma'am. Um, had to bring a piece in today, wasn't even mine, and I can tell you it was down probably in the last month because we had a big oyster spat uh, last month and a half. And every piece of plastic that's out there longer than that will have oysters on it. This piece was brand new, pristine. It's not mine, but did I bring it in? Yes, ma'am, got to. Um, we, we have to look after the industry. Otherwise, the state's not going to let us play anymore. So um, Anthony Hinkle's in the room back there. He asked me the other day about all the shops donating um, a fund, you know, per basket, whatever our shop runs to help set up a fund to police this stuff. I'm not against it. Not, you know, I'm not, not totally sold on it, but I'm not against it either. We need to know who's going to be policing this. We need to know where the money's going to go. Um, my biggest debate with him was why am I getting punished for something that I don't do? But it, it's, it's really more for the good of the industry, in my opinion, that's what we need to protect. Um, so we're, we're in it. We're going to do whatever is discussed and what, what we need to do. How do we get these people? Another thing you hit on the farmers. Do I go look in their boat? You know, if this man brought me 30 baskets today, do I go check his boat out to make sure all his plastic, if that's what he's using in there? No, I do not. That's, that's my fault. I guess. Um, I don't wear that badge yet, but maybe I should take that on as part of it. Cause 
I don't know how you, you convince these people to pick things up and go, you know, do the right thing. It's, uh, it's a lot of them. I mean, they're going to go pull on deep water or high tides. They can't get overboard. They're using power rollers and stuff. They've gone out the day before, rolled one side of the plastic up. They're going to go pull it. They're not doing it on a, on a low tide. So when do you go back and get it? Um, you know, that's just the question. How are we going to make them do it? I don't have that answer. All right. Any more questions? Uh, uh, I had a couple questions. So most of my uh, hard shell clam experience is up north in New England and Maine. So is it allowed in the state of Florida to plant, like, actually in the sand or no? Yeah. Yes. Yes. A long time ago, they actually used to, on the East Coast, they would take buckets of sand and pour over their backs. Okay, because, so, and then the, is it true that the primary pers purpose for the plastic net and then the chicken wire is to put over the other um, fabric net so the um, stingrays primarily don't get it? Yeah, prevent presentation. So, has, I don't know if anyone's done this because this is what I've we've done up north is you just, you clean the area out where you want to free plant the seed, take all the predators out, well, like conks and whelks and moon snails and crabs and any rocks. You free plant the oyster, sorry, clam speed, and then you put a net over it, and then you have the rebar on it. So that's what I've seen. So I was curious about that. I've heard a man doing that once. Well, the bottom, well, the bottom planting method works, works very well. Works very we well. have in fast in the tidal areas. This is a subtitle of Florida. Florida. And again, we had limitations on mechanical harvesting. The bag, as I mentioned earlier, was developed for Florida conditions and it works very well in Florida. I mean, in Cedar Key, if you saw the number of bags that are harvested on a daily basis because of the efficiency of the system, nobody would go to free planting and bottom net covering. I mean, it really is, the question is, um, it's not effective enough for these big schooling um, fish predators. That's why we go to the additional cover netting. Uh, you had a question. Yes. That's, That's why, why you, you see, see that, that sign, sign when you come, you come into, into town, town USA, USA number, number one, one producer of hard clams. Well, well, don't, don't think about that, Virginia. Then, then that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking at the map, um, obviously the dots are there. Do you feel like the industry would be supportive of a community involved? organized based cleanup maybe biannually right, right. And, that's and that's something that we're um dep big ben seagrass this is part of the seagrass is aquatic preserve um we will be participating we participate every year every year um the limitation is um, you most of the people in the room know the area it's shallow rocky that sort of thing so most of the area where the woods are tends to be your oyster reefs uh marsh grass that sort of thing um so we utilize the airboat on that day so my question is exactly so my question is if we could in the, in the near to far future, far future uh, organize, um, organize something, do you feel like the industry would support a biannual cleanup? Let the man that sort of sort of I'll go back to you. We'll just answer real quick, and then Sue is back on. What you're looking what at, you're looking on, at the on the map, and we're all, and we're all it looks like, it's looks like it's yellow pieces of cheese. cheese. That's up in the that's grass. Up in the so grass. Four line, four line. Two calls went, went out. Was it yesterday, Sue, you went out? And you, and you had a whole new appreciation for airboats, didn't you? Airboats, didn't you? That's what it's. That's what it's. An airboat is. An airboat is what it's going to take. I don't think F Max is going to get us a fleet of airboats. But if you guys, but if you guys, it would much appreciate a lot easier for us to clean the shoreline. So the top would be. Yes. 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 That's the answer. Was yes. Yes. That was initial part. Yes. Our association and our industry would love to help. Yeah. Okay. No promises. <laughs> no, no, you spoke. We heard it. Everybody heard it, right? Do you have a question? Oh, oh you got an answer. Okay. Uh, the international coastal cleanup occurs every year, and it's more of a scientific grab, and we do it 
with the international coastal standards of a certain time. And we just want to count what all the debris is out there, not just cover net, but everything. So that's a four hour stint. That's not a true cleanup. That's just, that's just what we do. But our organization this year, every year we put a, a dumpster out for extra time for all our members and all the people that want to bring cover net in for one week. This, this year we put it out for two weeks. So two weeks you have to get cover net in everywhere so you can work the tide you'd like to work. But uh, I think we should have, and I think the organization has talked about having a second day, which would be better for timing with tide and targeting strictly aquaculture gear at that point. And I'm sure we're gonna come up with that date too. But I just want you to know when we do Saturday, that four hours is not the old, whole time. We have two weeks of this dumpster sitting down at the marina. You want to go ahead and start putting Skid's presentation on? Uh, any other questions, uh, any, real quick, because we're quick. running out of time on this session? And I want to thank, and I want to thank you guys here. Guys here busy guys. guys. They took their afternoon, they afternoon, took their afternoon off, off coming here and sharing. Share 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 so thank you. So thank you. All right, folks, so our next guest speaker is he's come all the way from New England. You know, I was expecting him to call a few days ago and let me know that he wasn't going to try to brave a hurricane and uh, cancel on us, but he. Bob has made a, a trip down here and uh, is risking a lot of airport layovers to, to be here. So we really appreciate it. Uh, Bob's the executive director of the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the big picture issues and lease stewardship and public perception of the industry. Hope we don't need that. Is the sound working? Excellent. So um, before I became uh, the executive director, I was an oyster farmer in Rhode Island for about 25 years, started off as a hatchery. So I'm not just a, uh, a talking head. Um, I know what it's like to, to farm. I know what it's like to have your farm destroyed by a storm. Uh, and I know what it's like to, to have permitting battles. Uh, and I, I got some newsletters on the back shelf there. And I just wanna point out that permitting battles are getting worse everywhere. Um, as we get more and more floating gear and, and it, People don't like to look at dirty, muddy people working in their front yard when they're at their multi-million dollar vacation home and they want to go sip their margaritas and look out at a pristine watershed. But uh, they don't own the water. Um, and, and thankfully, um, we are allowed in many cases to lease the commons to grow shellfish. But that is a right that, that can be taken away if we screw it up and we make a mess, um, it's gonna get harder and harder to, to get a lease. So I'm gonna say some things here that, that some of the growers in the room probably don't like, but I'm not just worried about your industry or your farm. I'm worried about the big picture and the growth of the industry writ large and our survival and, and our you know, future prosperity. So, um, you know, real quick, this is uh, the status of the industry. I, I represent growers from Maine to Florida. It's just about $165 million industry, about 60% clams. Production has been sort of flat. Oyster production has doubled in the last five years, and the price is, has been pretty solid during that period, which means that oyster consumption has more than doubled in the last five years, which is pretty exciting. Um, we got some big growers, big, big uh, producing states and some states that are hardly producing anything at all. And some of this data is not real great, so I wouldn't hang my hat on it, but there's a few states that have solid production data. Um, the difference in the, the reason why, you know, North Carolina is producing so little compared to Virginia, is not because their water's any worse or because their people are lazy. It's because of the regulatory environment. It's not allowing that industry to grow. I think we fixed some of those regulations and that industry is starting to take off. But there's other states that still have regulatory challenge. The, the, the point of my bringing that up is that regulations can make your life miserable. Um, they will determine whether your industry can grow or not. And we, 
our behavior in the commons largely determines what those regulations are going to look like. So um, just to point out that this industry is very young. I mean, when I started out, we were painting chicken wire to get two years out of it because they hadn't invented plastic coated mesh yet and they hadn't invented these fancy bags here. You know, these were great, but uh, if you don't protect your shellfish from the predators, you can quickly lose the whole crop. So um, there are some places like up in Duxbury Bay where we don't have a lot of predators and you can replant on the bottom, but I wouldn't say that's a common uh, common thing that you can do this and get away with it. We have had this rapid evolution that's uh, developed. This, I sold my industry because it has taken care of so many of the things that we worry about. Uh, and in a very innovative way. And, and now we're seeing uh, Ketchum's got new designs and lots and lots of adaptive radiation. We got the SEPA baskets and the Hexel baskets and the flip bags on the West Coast producing this really marvelous, um, the meat in these flip bag oysters is like a steak. It's crazy. Um, so there's just, you know, and, and we're still learning how to do this. It's, uh, it's kind of cool. Um, I was always said that you know, the good thing about going to work in this business is that every spread a little bit kludgy. It's got some so that it'll handle it. But we went around all the community. Basically, you're trying to get people um, who have been in aquaculture to pay us less. Um, as you develop, you your go through this spreadsheet. It's sort of like a Chinese menu. You pick one from column A and one from column B, and you come out, and it can pump out a trifold um, brochure to help you market your product. It just goes on like this, and, and this is why we care about the environment. And help them up here. Unfortunately, you know, this was the primary uh, goal of our uh, five years. They completed it. I found out that probably it's a great exercise for you to do. Um, but adoption has been pretty slow. But basically, you know, it's pretty when you simplify it and boil it all down. It's follow the rules. Don't bring in an uninspected diseased seed. Pick up your trash. Don't be an eyesore. Stay within the lines and don't get anybody sick and be a good neighbor. I mean, that's what it all boils down to. Um, if your farm looks like this, everybody's going to hate you and um, it's going to rub off on the entire industry. But this was after a big blow, so I give them a pass. Um, this is the next battleground, and we're seeing it up and down the coast. We're seeing it in New England. We're seeing it uh, on the West Coast, especially. Uh, I was asked to come give a talk in, in Scotland and, and in uh, Loch Fine, apparently. There's a lot of oyster growing, and, and there were all these little plastic things on the bottom. And everybody was going up and down the beach with a bunch of oyster people. And, and what are these things? And it was the, the plastic that somebody identified how to keep a bag on a rack and bag. And it was a really cool little uh, device that, that was very ingenious. And there were hundreds of them on the beach. And some of them were painted and color coded for different farms. But everyone came away from that beach saying, that's a bad idea because it's plastic waste everywhere. Um, on the West Coast, now they got people coming into hearings and they bring a bag of aquaculture gear that they picked up off the beach or stolen off somebody's lease and they dump it out in the public hearing just to say I don't want more plastic debris in my uh, watershed we shouldn't be granting uh, more leases I'm getting this in New England now as well people are doing the exact same thing saying plastic debris is something I don't want to be associated with uh, whether it's muscle discs or all kinds of gear uh, zip ties uh, on the West Coast, they have actually made it a mandatory uh, permit condition in your Army Corps uh, to have participate in two annual uh, cleanups. And I think that, you know, if we don't do this ourselves, it will become a mandatory uh, deal. Um, you know, so plastic sources, um, the, the, 
the, the thing is, is that so much of this is, it would be so much easier and less expensive if we dealt with it on the front end and prevented it than if we try to pick it up. There's this huge effort right now to go out and clean out the specific garbage patch, they call it, this big patch of, if we spent a fraction of what they're spending to go clean up the Pacific garbage patch on prevention of it getting in the water in the first place, we could have a huge impact. I was doing some consulting work with a, a, a scalp farm in the Philippines, and uh, we were paying valedictorians $2 a day. Now, if I can pay somebody $2 a day to go around and pick up plastic bottles on the beach and dispose of it properly, I can prevent a hell of a lot more marine waste from getting into the ocean than I can do for, what can I do for $2 in the US? I can't do hardly anything. Um, so, you know, when 82% of the marine plastic debris is coming from Asia, that's where we need to focus. And I understand that when you can't feed your family and, and, and everything is sort of touch and go and survival, that you, you know, worrying about dumping your plastic is sort of the last thing on your list. But if we are going to invest in plastic reduction, it should be source reduction, and it should start in Asia. Uh, less than 2% of uh, plastic debris is coming from the U.S. and Europe. Uh, still, remarkably, only about 14% of plastic is being uh, recycled, and I think that, that is a huge challenge. Um, but right now, in the U.S., we are being singled out as a source, a significant source, and that is... Um, you know, both fishing gear and aquaculture gear, and a lot of it's conflated, um, whether it's tangling whales or turtles or, you know, charismatic megafauna, um, or, or it's just showing up on the beaches. It's a, it's a black eye on our industry, and it's going to come back and bite us if we don't start to deal with this ourselves. Um, the Science on Microplastics is an article in my newsletter uh, written by Sandy Shumway, who's working with Evan Ward and, and the University of Connecticut. And she has looked at uh, the vast majority of the science on microplastics, crap science. It's not done right. They are misidentifying stuff. They are not using the right techniques. They're, uh, it's, it's poor science not being peer reviewed properly. But the, the literature is filled with it. And this is. Again, it comes to bite us, and there are uh, talk a little bit about the impacts of this on human health and wildlife. Uh, but basically, we're talking about things that are less than five millimeters, whether it's from wild fabric getting washed in, in, in a sewage treatment plant, or microbeads in cosmetics and cleansers, which are being banned. So often, it's the degradation of larger pieces of plastic. Um, and rope, it's very challenging to measure. Uh, the doing it right is almost impossible. Um, and there's standardized methods right now. So there's a huge amount of stuff being published right now, and uh, most of it's garbage. Um, so if you're up by a piece of plastic, it's going to be a bad day. Um, if, it's, you know, if you get it out of your stomach, it's, it's going to be a bad day. With plastic, um, very limited evidence other than, than filter feed and water feed that the microplastics are having uh, impact. Um, there, there is uh, one study that indicates that the microfibers are migrating into various tissues of the body. I don't know if I believe that because there's so much bad science out there. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about adsorption of toxins and bacteria on plastics that are then ingested. So you're ingesting more plastics and uh, halophilic uh, or uh, hydrophobic uh, toxins. Um, frankly, almost any particle in the marine environment or anything will have bacteria uh, toxins. I'm, you know, questioning whether these micro particles are from inner particles in the water column. And frankly, again, there's just this, we're, we're filled with science that is highly questionable. Um, 
So, you know, impacts on humans, well, you know, most fish have microplastics in their gut, but we usually dress the fish. We don't eat the fish whole. Shellfish, we eat the whole thing, so we are eating those microplastics. What's the impact on humans? There's a lot of speculation, um, but it's, what's also clear is that the amount of microplastics that you eat from shellfish is dwarfed by the amount of microplastics you inhale and the amount of mouse microplastics in household dust that settles on your plate while you eat dinner. So I am personally not worried because I ain't dead yet. But um, there are a large number of people who are very worried and who are putting a lot of publications out that suggest that this is terrible and the sky is falling. Um, the, a great uh, paper came out, you know, very recently that, that suggested that uh, the current state of knowledge is that we can assume that microplastics in seafood are unlikely to cause harm either directly or by their ability to act as vectors for contaminants. However, there's much we do not know. So I am in that camp. I, I uh, was very pleased to see this just came out last week because um, it confirms what I've been saying for a couple years now. Um, but that doesn't matter because the public perception is what matters. If people think there's plastic in their oysters, they aren't gonna eat oysters. If they think there's plastic in their food, I've already had people say, I won't eat tuna from the West Coast, it's got radiation from Fukushima. I've had people tell me they won't eat oysters because it's got microplastics in it. So the public perception is what matters, and, and the public perception is being formed by a, a whole raft of, of questionable science as well as you know these these charismatic megafauna pictures are uh, you know you see the seal or the turtle with a plastic waste on it um, it's gonna piss people off and you know we I think this is largely a self-inflicted wound that we can prevent we can do the right thing before they prohibit us from using plastics there is actually discussion on the west coast right now in Washington State of banning the use of plastics in the shellfish industry. I don't think we can do this industry without plastics. Just saying that right out front. Plastics are our friend, but we need to make sure that we are doing a good job recovering it. So how, you know, uh, how can we do this? Again, prevention, obviously minimize the sources, dispose of it appropriately. Can you use non-plastic alternatives? Uh, I am trying to get everybody to stop using zip ties. I am convinced that you can tie a half hitch and a piece of twine just as fast as you can put a zip tie on. Um, I, I just, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people shaking their heads, but it doesn't take long to get good at tying a clove hitch. Um, are there non-plastic alternatives, biodegradable materials, metals that rust out that you can use? You know, I love hog rings. You can get hog rings either stainless or non-stainless. The, stain, the non-stainless ones will go away after about 10 years. Um, storms and vandals, obviously you gotta plan for the worst and then plan to recover after those storms and, and get as much of that gear up as possible. But, you know, we have seen uh, this happen in, in Virginia and they were able to turn it around. So Virginia, they've got these cover nets that are 16 feet wide by about 50 feet long, and it's blueberry netting, essentially bird netting. And uh, for when they started that industry, they would just, you know, the stuff would get fouled up and it would be hundreds of pounds that you would have to lug in and pay to dispose of. And people were just cutting it and setting it free. And it was ending up in the marshes. And I've seen aerial photographs of this kind of netting up in the marshes, and they almost shut that industry down. And the industry got together, and the Strong Growers Association in Virginia, they, they, they was a lot of peer pressure, and they said, look, we're gonna mark every net, and we're gonna make sure every net gets disposed of, we're gonna arrange for, for dumpsters, and we're gonna not let this happen to us anymore. And, and they, they, they also organized cleanups, and they get the NGOs involved, and they publicize it, and they now when you go to Virginia and you look in the paper, there's they get a positive impact for the industry, not only for supplying jobs and economic development, but because they're they're doing these organized beach cleanups and they are recovering uh, debris, and and the 
image of the industry is one of, uh, that's very positive in the public. And that's where I want to be. So I'm going to steal some slides here from the PCSJ, the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association, because they, you know, they got whacked. They, they, they now have a regulation. Um, and they go out and they do twice a year beach cleanups and they collect it all and they, they decide where it's going to go. And this is what they found over the years. So, you know, from 2005 to 2016, they get, you know, huge amounts of waste are being collected in these beach cleanups. And they document how much of it is non-aquaculture gear and how much of it is aquaculture. And typically, you know, between 11 and 25 percent is is aquaculture gear. Disturbingly, it's the percentage is not changing. So we're not doing a good enough job of preventing. Uh, we're not improving over time, as I would have hoped. Uh, but what turned up? Well you know, of 24 cubic yards in this one cleanup that they did. Uh, styrofoam was 19%, rope, netting, other. But that's, you know, typical marine debris of the aquaculture gear, which was about 11% that year. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, 56% of it was able to be recycled or reused, sold, or, or recovered by growers. Uh, and, and only 44% needed to be trashed. But, you know, this is what they were finding. Uh, they use uh, PVC pipe to grow gooey ducks, and they've got gooey duck, they got netting over the top of that, oyster culch sacks, uh, clam sacks, these muscle discs, rubber bands, zip ties, all of this stuff. And um, what they have done is they've, again, mandated, everybody is tagging significant pieces of gear. So when they identify what the main challenges are, uh, it, they, they mandate tagging that gear. So if your main challenge is cover nets, then you know you need to find a way to probably think about tagging that. If you've got some other issue, then, then you know as you go through and you catalog what you find in a beach cleanup, that helps you target what needs to be tagged because tagging leads to uh, shaming and peer pressure and changing of behavior. Um, yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's a pain in the ass, but I, I, I tagged my gear for years, uh, led to a major violation notice when my gear was found in the wrong place. We got a cease and desist order and an illegal aquaculture fine. But uh, you know, it was, um, yes, I was guilty. Um, so they've held multiple grower meetings. They've had, uh, they partner with the ENGOs. I think that's great. Get, you know, um, and get a lot of publicity. Get out there on the, on, the, on the social media and get other people involved. People want to help clean the environment. Uh, and then, then you get the positive credit for it. Um, and it puts you in a good light in the public eye. Um, they have a, a big festival. They call it the Slurp. And they generated a lot of money. And they use that money to pay for dumpsters. Uh, that they filled up with crap, uh, and they, you know, collected over a weekend 10,000 pounds of debris. Uh, that's awesome. And, and they publicize that, and they get a positive image in the public eye instead of the negative image, and that's where you want to be. Um, you know, otherwise you get these sorts of ads in the papers where people are photoshopping images of marine debris into... Uh, Anti, uh, anti aquaculture groups like protect our shoreline. Uh, we don't want to be there. Gear is still showing up in waterways. Beach cleanups are still needed. But, you know, if you want to avoid regulations, you need to implement proactive best management practices and be aware if you're losing gear, you got to try and track it and you got to secure it in storms and maintain it. Um, looking out on the horizon, so. You know, they are getting positive media coverage, both in, on the West Coast and in Virginia, about their beach cleanups. They get uh, local press. They get radio interviews about it. And it puts a positive spin on the industry for a change. Even though we are making a problem, when we clean it up, we get the positive spin. It's, that's where you want to be. Um, it, you know, it can be fun. You want to create, get a bunch of people and, and, and make it happen. Um, 
site-specific cleanups, you find that, that uh, plastic tends to accumulate on the same spot and the same gyre and the same beach every year. So after you generate a few of these maps like this, you'll start to know where to look. And uh, um, you know, marking gear, like I say, uh, one of our advertisers is Nelco Products in our newsletter. Uh, they've got heat shrink tubing that you can have custom printed. They've got uh, marker ties with two zip ties and one zip tie and all kinds of different solutions. Uh, there's a group catching tags that, that makes trap tags that you can use that are uh, embossed with your, your, you know, identifying markers. Um, but if you, if you figure out what your plastic is, labeling on that to allow you to identify the offenders and then it let industry bring the peer pressure on to do do its thing um, and anything anything you can do to help with dumpster expenses and beach cleanups and paying for airboats uh, you know if you had an airboat that was available for a few weeks and two growers from each farm were said look you gotta go you're gonna send two growers out on Monday you're gonna send two growers out on Tuesday and we're gonna clean up this whole area um, you know, you can't, I'm just trying to be creative because you're going to have to be creative. Um, you know, improve public education, get your legislators out there on the farm, uh, get some signage, kiosks, you know, your extension folks are going to be very helpful there. Get the press involved, work with your NGOs, because uh, if you don't fix it, they will regulate it, and I guarantee they will make it harder and and you know, cl cludgier, and, and it'll be much worse if you let them regulate it than if you take care of it yourself. So what do we do? You know, what we know doesn't work is saying, it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. That doesn't work. We have to acknowledge the challenge, propose steps to address the issue, marking and shaming, beach cleanups and peer pressure, and then, you know, we can also work with gear manufacturers to discuss alternatives. Um, you know, there's a next, a next edition of our newsletter is going to come out with a, an article on a new anti-fouling paint that has been developed and FDA approved. So give it a try. Maybe it works on your stuff. Maybe it repels cow nose rays. I don't know. I'm thinking we need to be creative, people. Um, there, there's probably something that you haven't thought of. Um, encourage experimentation. The conventional wisdom is probably wrong. Foster a strong local growers association. I can't emphasize that enough. Work together, people. I know it's a dysfunctional family. I ran an association in Rhode Island for 20 years. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Excellent, thank you. So um, I was just wondering, we talk about NIMBYism a lot and folks that will show up to hearings not wanting aquaculture, sorry, not wanting aquaculture anywhere near um, where they have homes. I just wonder, um, either on the East Coast or the West Coast, if you have any idea whether there have been any metrics um, made available or um, just even anecdotal um, information about um, what these types of proactive measures have done in terms of the numbers of leases that have been approved versus what had been um, either challenging to get through or disapproved in the past? Yeah, there, there are no metrics. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, I can say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that as we, you know, as we find most recently, we are moving more and more, especially with oysters, into floating gear because it gives you a better product, better survival, better growth. And floating gear is a nightmare to permit in front of, a waterfront mansion and so my life has gotten a lot more interesting over the last I want to say a couple of years and I had an article in my newsletter about how permitting is becoming a real challenge as the industry matures and the industry grows um, we need to prove that we can be good stewards in the environment 
or it's just going to get harder and the industry growth is going to stop. I mean, we're, we're experiencing a wonderful period of double digit annual growth in production, um, but we can, we can screw that up pretty easily. So I, no, I have no uh, metrics, but I can say without a doubt that marine debris is coming up at more public hearings as a cludge, a cludgeon, a, a bludgeon that they will use against us and um, whether or not it's true. But like I say, if we handle this right, we can get the positive spin um, instead of a negative. So it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to do it right. Yeah, Bill? Uh, you know, I just had, uh, I saw a lot of heads nodding in agreement with the idea of getting an airboat and sending out two guys from a farm, two guys from a farm. I, the only thing I would add to that is maybe make it a competition where, you know, there's some cash award for the team that brings in the most. I mean, you know, mo I'm not saying a bounty. I'm not saying a bounty per piece, but like, you know, if I, if I, if me and my buddy go out and we bring in the most weight, like, you know, maybe, maybe Case it, of beer. there's a little. They take, they take their, their net that they brought in as, and they brought, put it in the dumpsters and cheated so they would get the meals for a week. Bounties don't work. No bounties. Any more questions, Any more questions for Skid? Any more? Thank you so much. Appreciate your words of wisdom. Can you move this up there? Yeah. Some, some people. Okay. Um, again, I'm Mark DeHaven. I'm here, uh, a local uh, environmental specialist here with the uh, Division of Aquaculture here in Cedar Key. And uh, not that long ago, uh, when Paul Zajac was with our division, uh, he started working on a marine debris task force and trying to tackle uh, the aquaculture debris here in Cedar Key and, and get a grasp of what is actually here uh, what are the needs? Do we have any ideas to uh, get rid of it? And one of the first things we did was we went out and spent some time on the water by airboat many days and actually counted and uh, took uh, GPS waypoints using a handheld GPS, getting a waypoint of each piece we found of marine debris, whether it was uh, cover netting from the clams, um, crab traps, even some PVC pipe that washes up from the lease sites. So we took, uh, the red is the uh, initial, those points are the red is the initial uh, April 2015. And then uh, we came back and did some more in the yellow. So you start to see, you know, over time where each uh, hot spot is. And if you see the hot spots kind of, uh, are around the aquaculture use zones that are, are um, mostly used. Let's see if we have another, what's the next slide, Charlie? Okay, this is the updated one. If I go back, you can still see those hot spots are, are there. Gulf Jackson and Pelican Reef side, and then the, the, uh, the Dog Island Corrigan side, and then the inside Corrigan's area are the hot spots for uh, this cover netting. And in the initial uh, marine debris survey we did, we counted all the pieces and, and then we had the area cleaned up. We went back out post cleanup after paying for everything to get cleaned up and it was cleaned up. 
There was a few spots here and there that we had to get a, a little bit of extra stuff, but it was cleaned up. A year later, it was there again. In one year, we had gone back. We weren't to the point where we were before, but it was, it was kind of shocking to us at first to see that there was that much stuff back out there again. We've done three more of these since that initial time, and it's consistent every time now. It's not going up, it's not going down, it's just staying consistent. Um, I, I do know there's been a, a real effort to clean up. And uh, there's some groups that are going out and doing cleanup work on their own. And the, the cities and, and the uh, coastal cleanup that's done once a year has made an impact as well. But, it's not gone away completely and more cleanups definitely could be done. 99% um, of this is plastic cover netting. We don't see very many of the oyster cages. The guys wanna get those back. So anytime there's a storm, any big blow, I see the guys running around back here, picking up their gear. They wanna get it back as soon as possible. They are losing stuff. We, we find a few floating cages every once in a while, um, but 99% of that is plastic cover netting. Any questions or anything? Yeah, and uh, we can provide the farmers with these locations, and we've done that in the past, and I know Anthony and Clamtastic, they, I know, I'm sure that area just, just north of Dog Island North, I think you got those the other day, didn't you? I think, yeah, you, so I do know some of it's being cleaned up, but there is the, the talk about using airboat and getting groups of guys to go out there and clean this stuff up. Some of this stuff isn't easy. This stuff is muck up to your waist. Um, some areas are rock where you don't even want to take your airboat. We got stuck, didn't we, one time, Paul? <laughs> in the, up in those rocks. So it, it is extremely hard to ask people to go clean this stuff up. It's really hard because, first of all, you got to know you can't see it on this, but all this is fringing oyster bars, shallow water. You can only get in at high tide, and you can't see it at high tide. You got to have an airboat. You got to have some local knowledge, and you got to be tough, really, because it's it's a pretty tough environment to get out in and uh, clean this stuff up. Yes. She's got an extra helper. There is a lot of science behind it in terms of observation. Um, but the push to, you guys are out here a lot, that sort of thing. We're here mainly to, to hear the industry side and um, the airboats are a big deal, but it's mostly, you know, the hot spots are, this is a perfect visual. This is where it ends up. So if it is something that can be targeted at, the tides are predictable. Post storm, September is great because it's international coastal cleanup, but sometimes the tides are not in the favor. So typically January, February, March, it's not pleasant, it's cold, but you get longer time out on the water, you're more effective, that sort of thing. Um, so if this does become a community-based um, focus, um, a few cleanups a year, I think would you would see a deficit or a dip in the numbers um, as opposed to just a maintenance. I think the Aquaculture Association has discussed that type of thing. Even, you know, we've even discussed the 
adopt a shoreline type idea or yeah. adopt an area. But I don't think it ever it took, took off, off for one reason or another. Nobody, wa nobody wants to adopt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I think that that the twice a year idea is a great idea. I don't see I don't see any problem with doing that. I think the association has heard that enough today, and they've been talking about it without hearing it today. Um, I do think, though, there is still something we have to do to the clam farm workers because some of this is not accidental and somehow responsibility and i know that um he went, back to work. he went back to work but you know having that responsibility of the different shops and the different owners just saying guys did you use co you use covernet where is it i mean i think we have to start being a little bit more vocal and more of a of a watchdog to what you do if you have a, a clam house and you're having people come in and they work for you, you you've got to know that the covenant's not coming back and that bothers me that we don't target that i realize some of it does come off and some of it does blow up and get in the weeds and we know that but there has to be a little bit of accountability by the houses and taking pride in your business and I'm hoping that we can foster that. Um, and I think that you're not going to eradicate every yellow dot, but if we could see that it doesn't stay stable, that next year after two cleanups, it's decreased. That's good. And I do believe in the local people helping. And I think that positive uh, publicity by the newspapers and whatever that we're doing this and we're taking hold of this, is something we shouldn't be afraid of. I think for a while there were some of us that were afraid of that. But I, I have a person that gave me $200 toward coastal cleanup the other day who cleans up an area of Piney Point, and he brings in all this stuff every year, more, more cover netting than some of the clam farmers did. And he's got a positive attitude because we talked about how Heath is tying uh, floats. We'll just call them floats on cover net so you can go back at a better tide and get them up and that's a great idea and he's done that we were looking at them out there and maybe someone wants to pick a bottle up out of the water and pulls it and finds out there's a whole cover net there and gets it out i didn't say bottle float float it's a float but i i do think that this is a good thing but i do i do not think we'll ever eradicate it in defense of the farmer when it comes to covering that and um i think it was i think it was you said it when you look at a whole percentage wise the amount of pieces that are actually out there that are actually coming back in and you look at what we're losing i mean it's you'd be amazed if you saw what's actually is coming back in. we're 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 doing we're do, it's not perfect and we're not doing a great job but there there, there is there's people that do practice it and they do bring it. And they do bring it. I, 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 I know you guys bring it religiously. What I'm saying is I'm trying to defend a farmer. <laughs> There's a lot of this plastic out there that's on the bottom. And and and, and chicken wire too. And if you went out there on a blowout tide and you saw the amounts that's out there that's not floating away compared to what, what they do find. And over the years, how long was it before we started looking at the shoreline? When clamming started, and then the first survey. A long time. That's right. Like so 15 there was years or more. And then I know going around Piney Point, and this is just the, is an area where the where the where the point changes all the time, depending on the top, depending on the storm. And I've seen I've seen covering that get uncovered from the sand. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I'm saying, the farmers are doing a better job. They're tr they're trying to do a better job. But that doesn't make everybody perfect. Well, we know there's two types of cover netting debris. There's the storm washed it off my lease, and there's that fell off my boat or kicked off my boat on my way in. And I hope we could get a handle on the kicked off my boat on the way in 
You can't do anything about the stuff that you lose on your lease. You do your best you can to try and secure it to your, your stuff. Yeah? Right. Now, the, the race ban that the association is sponsoring and funding is located at your shop. So what have you observed over time? We've had it probably all day. It's filled every week, and it gets dumped twice a week. And it's, I mean, people jump on it to push it down. It gets filled amazing. It's nonstop. So I have a question as far as from a regulatory standpoint. I know Florida is completely different than Massachusetts. Florida is very similar to Maine. But in Massachusetts, in certain areas, the town there's already the state regulations but then in the towns where there's a lot of aquaculture they have more strict and more stringent regulations and over the years as aquaculture is getting bigger they've actually increased their um, employees that go out and regulate that making sure you have your buoys on the corner making sure your gear isn't floating away is that something that has been talked about here in florida yet or at all or is it open you want to answer and, that portia So in Florida, the state actually regulates all of aquaculture leasing, um, and we have been working on we have been working on trying to make sure we're getting out for more compliance visits at the lease sites to check the corner markers, make sure the poles are there, make sure they're not in the easements, there's not gear in the easements, because we've seen some of that, you know, after a wind or after a storm, the gear will kind of get blown into the easements, and we really need to make sure we keep those open. So those are things that we're looking at. Um, and, you know, I, I think in time we'll begin looking at the gear to make sure all the off-bottom gear is marked um, while we're doing those type of compliance visits. Um, so that is something that we're looking at. I, I haven't heard anything about any local jurisdictions trying to get involved. Um, at this point, it's all regulated by the state because it's state property. When we do do the cleanup, if there already is oysters and everything growing on a cover net, I think it would be wise just to leave it as it is because it's stabilizing the bar and it's holding the bar and you just create more of a problem when you rip it all up. I believe what we told Chris during the cleanup was if it's grown into the bar, cut what you can of the plastic off and leave the rest. Because like you said, you're going to destroy the bar ripping it out. And then we did, I don't think we did that at all. If it was on top and you could get it easily, definitely pull it out. But you don't want to destroy the whole bar pulling, the, pulling it out because it's already grown in and you're not going to do that. And I don't think you, you want to even try to do it. But didn't you cut it out? Yeah. Any other questions? I'll just wrap things up. Pete Davis, Davis is going to come up here and talk a little bit more about, about the multiple organizers and the cleanup that will happen on Saturday and improve hopefully the ongoing in the future and some other plans. So. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Charlie, I think what we learned in this workshop is, is the folks that we wanted to l make sure they listened to us left. So we need to chain them to the desk next time because they're the ones that are helping us with the funding of these projects. And we appreciate you staying for the whole time. We appreciate you ladies, especially you. We'll see you Saturday. We'll give you a t-shirt. That's right. That's right. And ma'am, you too. Thank you for saying, but, um, and others if I missed you, but, um, you know, I don't want us to leave here with a negative thought. And especially those of you that are learning here today, um, you know, Mr. Bob wrapped it up with the positives and, and, you know, when those industries and those other areas were forced to do something, which we hope we never get there. When you looked at the data, uh, the data supports that we're not the biggest producer. It's just we're the most visible. 
And this map says the same thing. But when you think about all the marine debris that's out there, and, and Sue Colson can bore you to death with years of numbers right here in Cedar Key, the tonnage wise, however you measure it, we're not. But as an industry, our, we put the bar very high. So we're not, the reason why we struggle with his grants is because we're already too good if that makes sense. We're not bad enough to get your money. Now I don't know what's wrong with that process, but maybe you can, after this, you can help. Okay, good, good. One of his questions is, is how many dead animals do you find in your gear? None, none. So, you know, correct. And everyone, anybody that knows Cedar Key knows that we have a wide variety of species here. There's a lot of animals, a lot of wildlife here. So anyway, we're not striving to be as good as everybody else. We're doing the same thing that Florida usually does. He pointed out when he mentioned to Charlie and Dax and their involvement. You know, we do research before we need to do research. We start testing before we need testing. In fact, we do it so well sometimes that other federal agencies use that against us. We're doing the same thing here. We're just setting the bar high. So this workshop was a grant. Charlie and the division listened to the industry. We applied for it, we got it, just like Paul did 10 years ago, Paul. We're doing it again. We know that this is an issue and we wanna fix it and we're gonna to try to fix. And the benefit for the whole area is gonna be that when we do get it completely fixed, we're not just picking up our stuff, we're picking up everybody's stuff. When you go to those dumpsters, it's got marine debris in it, not just our stuff that we lost or that we, uh, misplaced. Anthony brought up a real good point. We have a theft issue. We're working on it. We've applied for a couple grants. We're going to get those grants one day and we're going to solve that issue. When we solve that issue, a lot of this debris that you see on this map is going to go away. We feel confident. And it's simple. Why is that a fact? Because it costs money. We're not, this is not a charitable event. We're all in this business to make money. We need that covenant so we can use it again. That's why we evolved plastic as Leslie's presentation showed. The other issue is like Leslie's presentation showed is, is, you know, we're starting this on the ground up. You know, clamming didn't, nobody came here and said, hey guys, y'all are gonna clam. They came here to help us show us how to grow oysters and clamming just kind of accidentally took off. Nobody knew that. So all of the presentation that you saw in Leslie's presentation was us learning. And what'd you see? We learned the whole, all two decades. Now with the oyster presentation that Bill did, those folks are getting taught, but from other areas. So I want you to think about that. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was a young lady over there, um, no, it was you, you mentioned, uh, you know, transporting these oysters. What have we done? We've done things to fix that because there are some issues. We put local law enforcement and FWC in the same room Anybody that's got experience in that knows that's impossible. Cedar Key did it. We did it so that we could be educated across the board so we could solve those problems. So two weeks ago when we had that blow and it disturbed the floating oyster cages, farmer was bringing in about 20 cages of live oysters. He wanted to give them back to that farmer. He knew, he knew where they were. Um, we don't all tag, but we know who's gears who pretty much all the time. What he do? He called the local chief of police and he said, hey, I got these oysters. Um, I want to let you know so that we can get them to the shop. So that way there wasn't a law enforcement issue. Now those oysters went back and they're, you know, they'll be there for a long time while they you know, get clean. They were, they were juvenile, so they, they, you know, they want to harvest them. So that's another example of how we're doing the best that we can to make this pristine area always stay pristine. And so Chris is going to talk a little bit. He's got the most experience. He worked with Paul uh, with uh, the coastal cleanup with the, the industry did uh, with the grant last time. And what we've done is we've taken this map, this very map that Mark, and we're, we appreciate you, Mark, you know, with this because it helps us a lot. But we've taken this and we've divvied this up among the industry. And uh, we're working on these different areas. And, uh, and you know, a lot of the guys that are working on these areas, they don't use Covernet. They're like Joey. 
they you know they they don't have a covenant but they're passionate about the industry and 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 helping with the industry and it's an association thing so chris i don't know if you want to talk about that and talk about how saturday is going to go Oh, he's doing that. Am I close enough? <laughs> I, I got, I got, well, I don't want to embarrass Leslie. We got one story to tell. Um, when we started planning, you know, like our picture, we had these bags and everything was great. And all of a sudden, everything wasn't great. It was going bad quick. Her husband was the first one to use Covenant. But it was. What, it was my dog's fence. Dog, it was dog fence. That's right. And my dog had to stay there. That's right. So, <laughs> so her husband, he brought a roll of this dog fence out there and covered, and it worked. And of course, it was expensive. So that's how we got the chicken wire. So that's how this industry is really neat. That's <clears throat> thank you, Heath, and thank you for inviting me, Charlie. I appreciate that very much. Um, you know, there's been a lot of community involvement here too clean up this marine debris, just like Heath mentioned. And uh, we've worked really hard to do that. Um, Paul, and I want to thank Paul for the work he did and the Division of Aquaculture and Mark. For, I think it was back in 2014 when they hired us, um, our company, to clean up the marine aquaculture debris here. Um, we cleaned up over 90,000 pounds of material. It was really a very monu monumental task to do that. And um, it was the first cleanup that had ever been done in the whole time uh, that our industry has been working this area. So like we're gonna see on Saturday, you know, you're gonna have volunteers from the community involved and um, I think it's gonna go really well. Um, I'd like to bring out too that the uh, map that you guys are looking at here is after the cleanup that we did back in 2014, but it's also after the storms that we've just had. You know, you're gonna have like they, they brought out, the, a lot of this gear has been dislodged from the storm her main back in 2016 and also from Irma in 2017. So I think working together into the future, our association has talked, you know, about developing some ideas to, you know, really pay contractors to go out there and clean up some of this stuff and do this on a regular basis. Um, I, I like the idea of going out there either quarterly or biannually to do that. And it's going to take some money to do that. So we're actually, you know, in the process of asking the Department of Ag to help us in that aspect. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming and thank you very much. All right, folks. Well, that. Hold on. This microphone stuff's been serious. So. Thank you all very much for coming out, spending your afternoon here with us. We've got a lot of resources on the back table back there. Some are unrelated to the topic that we're covering today. Uh, some brought some, some of our new shellfish processing outreach materials and uh, just things like that. So make sure you check it out. Make sure you sign up on the way out. And uh, I guess just to summarize, what did we really learn today? It, um, we learned a lot of, we, you know, we learned about marine debris. We can see that it's a tremendous problem globally. There's a lot of people all over the country that are very interested and passionate about this problem. Aquaculture is a gnat on the wall, and everybody knows, you know, this is not something that we're truly making a large impact. Aquaculture is not really a marine debris problem on the scale that a lot of these other things is. But the, it comes down to us being visible in the commons and being out there and being able to be blamed. You know, so Larry threw his bottle out in Gainesville out the window. It rides for two weeks down the waterway. His name's not on that. He can't be blamed for that. But shellfish farmers, whether it's fair or it's not fair, can be blamed for it. And this is really, this workshop's hopefully about trying to prevent the, uh, what is really a great industry from getting a black eye unfairly. And, and really having its image damaged nationally because of something that's unjustified. So I really appreciate everybody being here. Make sure you check out our resources on the way out and uh, be glad to answer any questions if we have anything else. Did anybody have any other last comments or anything? All right, sounds good. Thanks everybody.